As crew on board sailing vessel Escape try to reduce the sail in a storm, unfamiliar equipment, heavy seas and their distance to land leave two sailors dead after an unconventional rescue operation. Carl and Anna-Marie Falker have been together for almost 19 years. True to their adventurous spirit, they get married on a beach in Mauritius. In 2016, they make a decision to give up their corporate life in Cologne, Germany, and follow a dream to sail around the world. Even though their friends and family think it's crazy, Carl and Anna-Marie commission the production of Sailing Vessel Escape. The model CNB66 is a luxury yacht with a price tag of almost $2 million. Escape measures 20.6 meters bow to stern and 5.5 meters at its beam. Architect Philippe Briand Bonnet has a challenging time designing such a large vessel for a small crew to handle. One of those challenges is how the mainsail is stored. On a small yacht, you simply fold it in a zigzag pattern called flaking and then tie it to the boom. That's easy to do with a light sail. But on a larger yacht like Escape, the sail is too large and heavy for Carl and Anna Marie to handle on their own. Bonnet, the naval architect, looks at furling or rolling the sail into the mast. This is a good solution because you can furl the sail easily even if you're heading downwind. But in-mast furling results in a large, heavy mast and a small sail, which isn't ideal for a large yacht. So Bonnet decides on a furling boom, which furls or rolls the mast down into the boom. That makes the boom heavier and unlike furling into the mast, when Carl and Anna-Marie furl the sail, they have to head into the wind to take the pressure off the sail so that it runs freely. Heading to wind is no problem for them. The majority of yachts have to do that anyway, so it's of little consequence. On deck, the cockpit is separated into two zones. One zone is for relaxing, which Anna-Marie likes, and another for operating the vessel, which is Carl's domain. After three years of planning and building, Carl and Anna-Marie launch and christen escape with the traditional breaking of a champagne bottle in March 2019. Then, Carl and Anna-Marie set sail to live out their dream, sailing to New York, Guadalupe, around the Caribbean, and arriving in Bermuda three years later in June 2022. On the 8th of June 2022, Carl Frank and his wife Anna-Marie are getting ready to sail north from Bermuda to Nova Scotia. At a boat show the previous year, Carl and Anna-Marie met two experienced sailors and invited them to join on this ocean crossing. On the longer, more challenging legs of the journey, Carl likes to have a few extra hands on deck. We don't actually know their names because they prefer to remain anonymous. So I'm gonna call them John and Mike. John is a US Coast Guard licensed captain with years of experience at sea. He'll act as second mate. Mike is also an experienced sailor and will be the third mate on the journey. As Carl guides them around the vessel, he points out areas he considers unsafe. One of Carl's main concerns is the mainsail sheets attachment near the dual helm stations, which is the rope that's attached to the end of the boom to let out or tension it to center position. He makes sure to explain that the mainsail fills into the boom, making it heavier than other yachts, which puts the main sheet rope under greater pressure. Everybody's happy and ready to go. On the 9th of June, Escape lifts anchor in Bermuda and departs as planned, waving goodbye to the beautiful turquoise water and golden sandy beaches. Because John and Mike are new to the boat, Carl assigns them to steer at the helm. It's good practice for new crew members to be assigned a single position on a yacht until they're familiar with the nuances of the boat they're on, starting with the easiest job. Anna-Marie will manage the mainsail sheet and Carl will take the more complicated controls and give directions. It's a beautiful sunny day and the wind is blowing 15 knots. Once they're out of the harbor, they hoist the mainsail and unfurl the Genoa at the front of the yacht. With the wind coming from behind, Anna-Marie lets out the mainsail sheet so the sail catches the wind. One of the dangers of sailing downwind is that the main sheet rope is fully extended. The main sheet is the rope that attaches the end of the boom to the yacht. It controls the position of the boom. 
If the wind changes direction and catches the sail from a different angle, the boom could swing all the way from one side of the yacht to the other with nothing to stop it. This is called an uncontrolled jibe. And if anyone is standing in the way, they can easily be knocked overboard, injured, or killed if the boom hits them. Carl instructs the crew to set up a preventer to hold the boom in position. This preventer is a rope that's tied to the boom. It runs forward to the bow, then back to a winch in the cockpit near the winch for the main sheet. This is John and Mike's first time on the boat, so they take turns at the helm for a few hours on the first day to acquaint themselves with escapes handling. In the first 24 hours, they cover nearly 200 nautical miles sailing downwind. Night sets in and Carl is on watch. During Carl's watch that night, a squall rolls in. Carl orders everyone on deck. He assigns positions and explains the reefing procedure to the crew. The wind has picked up, so Carl reduces the sail. In order to reduce the sail, he lowers the sail slightly and ties it to the boom, otherwise known as a reef. It's their first time reefing as a team. Wind and rain whips around them in the squall. John, the second mate, mans the helm. Anna Marie takes charge of the main sheet, which is anchored to the cockpit deck, then up to the boom and back down to a dedicated electric winch. She has to coordinate the preventer and the main sheet, letting out the preventer while taking up the slack on the main sheet. Carl goes forward to control the mainsail from a set of electric winches at the base of the mast. A few hours later, they put in a second reef with winds holding steady at 25 knots. John turns escape into the wind to take pressure off the mainsail. If wind catches the sail, it puts too much pressure on the furling system in the boom and they won't be able to lower the sail. By turning the yacht to sail into the wind, the boom sits in the center of the boat while the wind flows past evenly on both sides, balancing the pressure on the furling system and letting it run smoothly. During each reefing, John and Mike take turns at the helm and Anna Marie manages the main sheet to center the boom. After putting in several reefs during their first night on board, John and Mike help shake out the reefs and raise the sail to its full height. The sunrise lifts their spirits while they enjoy a hot cup of coffee. Over the next 24 hours, the weather calms down with winds ranging from 10 to 18 knots. Despite having full sails, they decide to turn the motor on for several hours while sailing downwind in these light conditions. Carl heads below deck to download weather updates. At two and a half days in, the weather and passage are exactly as predicted and escape is comfortably ahead of schedule. The weather reports suggest that by midnight or slightly after 0100, the wind will drop to 12 knots and is expected to decrease further overnight. After sunset, John, the second mate, takes watch from 2100 to 0100. Escape is sailing comfortably at 9 knots with winds at 18 to 20 knots under full sail. Carl heads below deck to take a break before his 0100 to 0500 watch. Carl is woken abruptly by his wife Anna Marie with an urgency in her voice. He's only been down for one hour, but escape is healing. The wind has picked up, reaching 25 knots with gusts nearing 30 knots. Third mate Mike is at the helm fighting the rudder to keep control. They battle the winds for two hours, but around midnight, they manage to get escape sailing smoothly. Carl heads to his cabin to finally get some much needed rest. It's only half an hour before Anna Marie wakes Carl once again. They've hit an unexpected storm 350 nautical miles south of Nova Scotia. The winds have picked up to 35 knots and Escape is riding the waves which reach almost 6 meters in pouring rain. Escape is heeled over and almost knocked down as the wind and waves continue to build. Carl calls for a second reef. He starts the engine and everyone takes their positions. Carl signals for John to steer Escape into the wind. 8 meter waves crash over the deck, rolling Escape from side to side. Carl starts furling the Genoa sail at the front of the boat before the mainsail. Anna Marie prepares the main sheet winch to center the boom. It's not clear exactly why, but as Escape rolls across the waves, the boom swings violently out of control between the main sheet and the preventer. 
In the heavy seas and a rapidly escalating situation, either Anne Marie lets off the preventer first instead of tensioning the main sheet winch, allowing the boom to swing suddenly, or the main sheet winch jams, preventing Anne Marie from taking up the slack and centering the boom. Or perhaps some lines get tangled in the whipping wind. In the urgency of the situation, Carl shouts orders in German, which John and Mike, the two Americans, don't understand. Carl hastily abandons the Genoa and rushes to help Anna Marie. Escape pitches into the wind while the boom swings wildly. Luckily, the preventer is attached, helping to slow the boom and prevent it swinging all the way across the deck. But the main sheet is loose and whipping in the wind. If it were to hit someone, they could be seriously injured or killed. It strikes Anna Marie, knocking her down like a half-ton whip. The third mate calls to her and Carl rushes to help her as the boom continues to swing wildly. The second mate shouts to Carl that the boom is swinging back, but it's too late. As the boom swings, the main sheet takes its second victim, pelting Carl from the side and throwing him to the deck. His left leg strikes the seating in the cockpit and is crushed below the knee. With compound fractures and the bone breaking through the skin, Carl starts losing blood. In less than 10 seconds, both Carl and Anna Marie are severely injured. The force of the boom, swaying wildly, snaps the preventer rope. The boom crashes across the deck, snapping the main sheet, leaving no lines attached to secure or even slow it down. The third mate, Mike, heads to pull Anna Marie out of harm's way while the tattered main sheet whips dangerously above their heads. She's been knocked unconscious. He pulls her into the cockpit and lays her flat on her back. He then tends to Carl, using a life jacket tether as a tourniquet to stem the bleeding. John, the second mate, rushes below deck for the medical kit and the e to send an emergency signal. While he's below deck, he sends out a mayday call for urgent assistance over the radio. There's no response. Mike hands Carl the satellite phone to make an emergency call while John continues on the VHF. Carl bites through the pain splintering up his leg while he dials the emergency numbers. At 0315, they make contact with stations in Germany, Halifax and Boston. They request immediate medical evacuation for the injured crew members and establish a schedule for updates. Escape remains out of control, her sails flapping wildly and the swinging boom continues to wreak havoc. John, the second mate, steers the boat downwind which catches the sail and holds the boom in position, stopping it from swinging dangerously across the cockpit. Third mate Mike tends to Carl and Anna Marie. John sets the autopilot, which briefly holds their direction. He crawls to the starboard side winch and manages to furl the Genoa sail at the front of the boat. It's been torn in several places from whipping in the storm. A wave rolls through and rocks escape, causing an uncontrolled jibe and the boom swings across the cockpit. John gets back to the helm and steers downwind for nearly three hours. When possible, he turns on the autopilot so he can help Mike with Carl and Anna Marie while the storm rages on. Escape is almost 400 nautical miles offshore, racing at 10 knots with the wind pushing it further eastward away from land and rescue. Mike maintains regular contact via satellite phone with the US Coast Guard and the Canadian Coast Guard in Halifax. A rescue helicopter can carry enough fuel for a rescue approximately 250 nautical miles offshore. Escape's remote location makes an immediate rescue impossible. And to hold the sail stable while sailing downwind, they continue to put more distance between themselves and land. On the 12th of June, the rescue organizations are devising a plan. A US Coast Guard cutter ship off the northeast shore of the US is more than a day away from escape, which is too far. But the ship has a supply of jet fuel on board. Instead of heading directly to escape, the cutter heads south. It will act as a lily pad for a rescue helicopter, allowing it to refuel for the journey to reach escape. While the cutter charts its course, a US Coast Guard rescue helicopter takes off with two rescue divers to rendezvous with the cutter. The helicopter lands on the Coast Guard ship, refuels, then takes off directly toward escape. With each update, the third mate assures Anna Marie and Carl they are one step closer to rescue. The third mate adds another tourniquet to Carl's injured leg using a sail tie. He raises Carl's leg with a cushion for comfort and stability. 
He supports Anne-Marie with cushions trying to lock her in position. He's concerned about the risk of a spinal or brain injury. Then he gets them water, covers them with blankets and starts putting together a ditch bag to go with them to hospital. He does his best to keep them alert, hydrated, informed about the rescue and how the boat is being handled. At 0200, the second mate John takes advantage of a brief lull in the wind and attempts to reduce the mainsail while maintaining their downwind course. He crawls toward Escape's mast and tries to furl the mainsail, but there's still too much pressure from the wind. It jams in the boom furler after only a meter and doesn't go any further. He grabs the mainsail and puts all his weight into it. He manages to pull down almost another meter of sail, which significantly reduces the exposed sail area. He gets back to the helm and tells everyone to brace themselves while he turns into the wind so that he can secure the swinging boom. With the engine roaring at full throttle, Escape turns into the wind and the boom swings unpredictably. John prepares a bowline in a rope and waits for the boom to settle. He throws the line over and tries to catch the end of the rope. Escape rolls over a wave and the boom swings out of reach. John brings Escape around again and waits for his next opportunity. Just after midnight going into the 13th of June, he manages to thread a heavy line around the boom. He lashes it down and centers the boom. At 0030, he alters course steering westward. For the first time in almost 24 hours, Escape is sailing towards land, closing the gap between them and rescue. Mike contacts the Coast Guard and requests a new heading. Things are going well until 0100 when the engines start to stall. John sees a rope trailing behind Escape in the prop wash. He shifts the engine to neutral, grabs a boat hook and leans off the aft deck to pull the line free. Mike joins in and they free the line from the propeller. A US Coast Guard C-130 Hercules long-range rescue plane arrives on scene ahead of the rescue helicopter to establish communication between Escape and the approaching chopper. At 0600, the helicopter arrives. It lowers its rescue basket to the deck with a rescue diver. Anna-Marie and Carl receive medical attention and are then hoisted up to the helicopter. Their condition is getting worse as the medics stabilize them for the long flight to hospital. John and Mike stay on escape. Once the helicopter departs, they set a course for 300 degrees to meet the US Coast Guard cutter. As the day progresses, the wind calms and the sea gradually settles. John takes a break heading below deck to rest while Mike takes the helm. They rotate shifts throughout the day, maintaining contact with the Coast Guard. Escape reaches the cutter about 350 nautical miles offshore. The cutter's crew secures Escape while John and Mike are checked by the ship's medic. They and Escape are in no condition to sail to port and so the yacht is abandoned at sea. The cutter coordinates with a smaller transfer boat and about 30 hours later the crew arrive at the US Coast Guard Boston facility for debriefing and interviews. Escape is later recovered by a salvage company and brought to Dartmouth Cove, Nova Scotia in Canada. When questioned, John and Mike didn't know why the main sheet wasn't tensioned. Only Carl and Anna Marie could possibly know. Carl was the only one working with the main halyard and boom furling system. He could possibly have trained John and Mike, experienced sailors, to manage those forward positions earlier in the voyage. When sailing around the Caribbean in light weather with just his wife, it makes sense for him to take that position. But in heavy weather and far from the safety of land, the decision to not deploy his experienced crew in complex positions cost him and his wife their lives. Anne-Marie died after the helicopter landed on the US Coast Guard cutter to refuel. Carl died during helicopter transport from the cutter to the hospital. Both were pronounced dead from their injuries on arrival at the hospital in Massachusetts. Heavy weather played a role in this accident. In the Sydney to Hobart yacht race, the weather took six lives. I'll leave a link to that story here.